Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, no matter where you are, no matter what time you're watching, welcome to the Sunday, June 13th service of Glen Abbey United Church. I am very pleased to be back in the pulpit and to be with you today as we come together as a family in Christ. And since we are never truly apart, may the peace of our risen Lord be with us all. Well, amongst our announcements today, first of all, I would like to thank you so much for your prayers and support as I recover from the surgeries. And a big thank you to Rick Sands for leading worship on May 30th and the Outreach Committee as well last week on June 6th. It is nice to be back, and through the wonders of technology, I should be in the pulpit every Sunday, even while convalescing at home. Secondly, reopening is on a lot of people's minds these days. It is wonderful to see the cases drop and the province beginning to reopen. However, please be informed that there is no Oakville Church that will be planning on opening before September, and some of them as late as Thanksgiving. So we definitely will be one of the first to open. The reopening committee is starting to meet again. Thank you very much for the work that they do. But we want to make sure that we reopen in a way that considers the needs of our entire congregation, including those who are ready to come into the building and those who prefer to watch at home. So stay tuned and you will be fully informed as we proceed towards that great day when we can be together again. Today we'll be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion. So if you haven't done so already, just press pause, go get a little piece of bread and a sacramental beverage for everyone watching, and then we'll proceed with the service. We always like to celebrate occasions together as we are a big family. And this week on June 12th is Brenda and Grant Giroux's anniversary. So congratulations to them. And it's even more special for them this year as their son Austin is home from BC for a five week visit. So congratulations to the Giroux's. Also on June 13th, our Lorna and Keith Evans anniversary. So congratulations to you. Two birthdays this week, both of them on the 15th, is Pat Thompson as well as Jan Peters. So we send our heartfelt congratulations to you. And Yvonne, would you please be so kind as to play happy birthday to Jan and Pat. There's a lot going on these days. There are a lot of things that we're concerned about and our minds are whirling at times. But it's important that we set aside this hour so that we can take a deep breath, so that we can listen for God's word and that we can come together to worship God. So I invite you to concentrate on the Christ candle, listen to the music, and prepare for worship. We'll begin with the words of the call to worship. We have gathered to worship God. 
we open ourselves to God's power and presence in our midst. God has chosen us. Let us worship God. And we'll begin with the singing of the communion hymn, number 457, as we gather at your table. Yvonne, choir, please. continue by saying together the words of the prayer of confession and invocation. Let us all pray together. God who forgives us, we need your healing. Please give us true repentance. We may have done things in the past we need forgiveness for, or maybe doing things these days we need to stop, or considering things in the future that we need to avoid. We ask that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us. Set us free to hear your word to us. Set us free to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the really good news of the gospel is that even though through life we sometimes end up in situations that maybe we shouldn't be in or things happening that we don't feel really good about, but yet God is always there to forgive, to lift up, to help set us on our way. And that is truly good news indeed. We'll now proceed with the sacrament of Holy Communion. Well, as we come together to celebrate one of our only two sacraments, the sacrament of Holy Communion, I invite you that you are invited to the table. No matter your background, no matter your membership, no matter your marital status, no matter your age, you are invited as we all are. Because this is not the table of Glen Abbey United Church. This is not the table of the United Church of Canada. This is the table of Jesus Christ and every one of us are invited to partake. So in the name of the one who said, I am the bread of life, I invite all of us to come and eat. In the name of the one who said, I am the true vine, I invite all of us to drink. In the name of the one who said, love one another as I have loved you, I invite all of us to the table of Jesus Christ. We'll begin with the words of the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. God, who loves us so consistently, we do give you thanks and praise. For even though you are holy, you are ever near and approachable for us. In the beginning, you created the universe, and all through time, you never forsake us, even when we turn away from you. You came into this world as Jesus, your word made flesh, to live this life in all its fullness. But while you were here, you were shunned and despised and forsaken. But yet, you made the cross of death a tree of life, the empty grave a sign of glorious hope. Therefore, with all your people in all creation, we say together your praise. Let us say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. And now we gather at this table to remember God's love made flesh in Jesus Christ. So when we think about those times when Jesus was here on earth with us, we marvel at the hospitality he would partake in because he shared food with his followers and friends like we all do, but yet also with saints and sinners, with crowds of thousands on the hillside, and then with a few friends in the upper room. On the night before he died, he had supper with his companions and he took a loaf of bread, and he gave thanks. And then he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And then in much the same manner, he took a cup, and he poured it out. And after giving thanks, he passed it amongst them, saying, Drink, this cup that is poured out is the new covenant that is made in my blood. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Because through this loaf and this cup, Jesus lives within us. But it's in our words and our deeds and examples that we set for others that Jesus lives among us. Loving God, we rejoice in the gift of your grace, remembering Christ's life, death, and resurrection, waiting in hope for his coming again. And grant that in praise and thanksgiving, we may so offer our lives to you that they proclaim this mystery of faith that we'll say together, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Send, O God, your Holy Spirit upon all of us and upon these gifts, that as we share together in this loaf and this cup, we may truly be the body of Christ. All glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever. And as our Savior taught us, let us pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This bread which we break is our communion in the body of Christ. The cup of blessing that is poured out is our communion in the blood of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God. And I'll invite you to take your elements. This is the body of Christ broken especially for each and every one of us. Let us give thanks as we eat together. The 
the cup of blessing reminds us of all the amazing things that Jesus did for us. And as a reminder, if you were the only person in the world who was in need of saving, Christ still would have died for you. Let us keep that thought in mind as we drink together. And let's join together in the prayer after communion that you'll find on screen. Let us say, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, help us to serve one another, and send us forth into the world united in courage and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Savior, Amen. Oh, time to get my mask on. Always got to make sure you wear your mask when you're around folks. Well, look who it is. Revted! Hi, Buford. Aw, oh, Revted. I missed you so much. Well, I missed you too, Buford. How have you been doing? Oh, I was pretty sad. What, you're sad because you're missing your friends or not at school or? No, I was afraid you forgot me. Buford, forget you? I can never forget you. Aw, oh, thank you. Well, you know, as we are here, in our church family, they never forget us either. Even though we might not be together in one place, we always think of each other. Yeah, that's so good to think about and to remember that people love us. Absolutely people love us. And you know who else does? Uh, let me think. Every week, the see right answer seems to be God. Right, you got it. God, Jesus, loves us, never forgets us, no matter whether we're together, no matter where we're apart, no matter where we are, never ever forgets us. And don't you forget God either. No way, I always will remember God loves me and I will pray every day. All right, Buford, it's great to see you again. You take good care, okay? You take care, too. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye for now. Our praise song today is one that is really, really speaks to us about the way life has been, especially this last year, how things don't always go the way that we hope it might. It's called Praise You in the Storm by Casting Crowns. And I really encourage you to either use the link that you received in the email or go onto our website and to listen and sing along with this song that is so appropriate for these times. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Loving God, we know that life doesn't always go the way that we hoped it would, and yet we need your guidance so much. More than ever, please, we need your presence, we need your encouragement, we need your clarity, we need your word for each of us. And it's different for everyone. So we pray today that whether it be through the songs that we sing, whether it be in the words that we hear, or maybe a moment of stillness that you speak to us, that you open our ears and our eyes to take it in, that our hearts and minds are receptive and that we ponder it and then give us the courage to do something about it in the full confidence of knowing how much we are loved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And today, I'd like to invite John Fleming for readings from 2 Corinthians, as well as Psalm 92. John, please. 
Our first reading today is from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 20. We are ruled by the love of Christ. Now that we recognize that one man died for everyone, which means that they all share in his death. He died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but only for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. No longer, then, do we judge anyone by human standards. Even if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards, we no longer do so. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being, the old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making all human beings his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells us how he makes them his friends. Here we are, then, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. Our second reading is Psalm 92, reading verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 15. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, at the works of your hands I sing for joy. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. In old age they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap, showing that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Thanks be to God for these holy words. And thank you, John, for a fine job on the reading. Our second reading from the New Testament today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. It's long, but it's good. So I invite you to hear, listen for the word of God as we hear what was recorded in the book of Acts. In the meantime, Saul kept up his violent threats of murder against the followers of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked for letters of introduction to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he should find there any followers of the way of the Lord, he would be able to arrest them both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem. As Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, suddenly a light from the sky flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, he asked. I am Jesus, whom you persecute, the voice said. But get up and go into the city where you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with Saul had stopped, not saying a word. They heard the voice, but they could not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground and opened his eyes, but could not see a thing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. For three days he was not able to see, and during that time he did not eat or drink anything. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. He had a vision in which the Lord said to him, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, get ready and go to Straight Street. And at the house of Judas, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. 
He is praying, and in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come in and place his hands on him so that he might see again. Ananias answered, Lord, many people have told me about this man and about all the terrible things he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come to Damascus with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who worship you. The Lord said to him, Go, because I have chosen him to serve me, to make my name known to Gentiles and kings and to the people of Israel. And I myself will show him all that he must suffer for my sake. So Ananias went, entered the house where Saul was, and placed his hands on him. Brother Saul, he said, the Lord has sent me, Jesus himself, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here. He sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like fish scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he was able to see again. He stood up and was baptized. And after he had eaten, his strength came back. Paul stayed for a few days with the believers in Damascus. He went straight to the synagogues and began to preach that Jesus was the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and asked, Isn't he the one who in Jerusalem was killing those who worship that man Jesus? And didn't he come here for the very purpose of arresting those people and taking them back to the chief priests? But Saul's preaching became even more powerful, and his proofs that Jesus was the Messiah were so convincing that the Jews who lived in Damascus could not answer him. Thanks be to God for these very holy words. Well, my message title today is, Whom Does God Choose? Well, one was the Apostle Paul, who was one of the true heroes of the early Christian movement and has since been canonized as Saint Paul. In the days when the apostles were following the Great Commission to go out and make disciples of all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, two main leaders emerged. There was Peter, whose main responsibility was converting the Jews in Israel to become Christians, and then Paul, whose mission was to inform the Gentiles or roughly the rest of the known world. It has been said that if it wasn't for Paul, Christianity would have likely remained a small Jewish sect in Israel. Well, in the development of early Christianity, St. Peter was known as the first pope and the first bishop of Rome. And the Roman Catholic Church concentrated on good works as being the way to salvation. Now, Paul, on the other hand, he was convinced that salvation is not a matter of works we accumulate, but a matter of faith, which the Protestant reformers adopted wholeheartedly. Faith versus works. Peter versus Paul. Well, just down the street from where we live in Hamilton is a Roman Catholic church and school that are named St. Peter and Paul. And it got me to thinking, our Protestant leaning towards faith can also be demonstrated by our church names. Now, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome that I know many of us have visited, and where St. Peter is supposedly buried, that's an astoundingly beautiful cathedral. Now, St. Paul's in London was a Catholic cathedral until the Reformation, when it became one of the most beautiful Protestant churches in the world that, again, many of us have seen. Well, in the United Church of Canada, you will find a St. Paul's United Church in almost every city in town. There are over a hundred of them. 
Now, contrary to this, if you look up St. Peter's United Church, there are maybe eight in the whole country. While Paul has captured an incredible amount of wisdom in his letters, which are also known as the epistles to the earliest churches, in places such as Rome or Corinth or Ephesus and many others, now these were some of the key cities on the major trade routes at the time, and they were highly important in influencing those who would then take the good news abroad with them to spread the gospel message throughout the world. Now, as usual, scholars debate about just how many he actually wrote himself, but the 13 letters that later became books of the Bible that are attributed to Paul, and they're placed in the Bible in order from the longest to the shortest. 94 pages that Paul's letters encompass, they take up a full 30% of the New Testament. If we consider the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they each range between about 30 to 47 pages. So we can see that Paul has made a major contribution to the New Testament and it has had tremendous influence on the early Christians and right throughout the centuries. Well, during his ministry, Paul traveled three major journeys, and he devoted his life to spreading the gospel throughout the known world. And it wasn't easy. Besides the lack of modern transportation, during his travels, he had been shipwrecked, he had been persecuted, he had been imprisoned a number of times, and finally he was beheaded in Rome. Anyone with this level of dedication and such an important mission, they must have been chosen by God from an early age and preparing for this mission all his life, right? Well, sometimes it's easy to forget that the passage we read from Acts 9, the one about that villainous Saul who was a Pharisee who absolutely hated the Christians, vigorously persecuted them, and then fell blind on the road to Damascus? That was Paul's story, because after his life-changing experience, Saul, the great enemy of Christians, became Paul, the great messenger of Christianity. When Paul writes about transformation, he truly knows of what he speaks. And consider what a huge turnaround this was in Saul's life. And let's consider our own lives. What kind of transformation can God work in our life? We may be someone who held grudges. God can help us to let them go and start enjoying life more, released from those burdens. We may have felt unloved, we may have been mistreated by family members. But just for a moment, just imagine everyone who is tuning in this week. And we will see people who truly care about us because we are all an important part of our church family here and everywhere. And God is working through all these people to help us in our lives. Have we been judgmental of others? Have we found it difficult to forgive others' trespasses or maybe our own? Well, we can pray to God to soften our heart. And it wasn't so long ago that God spoke these words one morning into my heart that I have adopted as a sign-off on my Wednesday pastoral letters. May God soften our hearts to see others as generously as we see ourselves and to see ourselves as generously as God does. Have we been truly open to accepting newcomers who might be quite different from ourselves? Christ can help us to be so much more accepting and open when we follow what he instructs us to do. Take today in Acts 9, when Saul was struck blind, we then read about that Christian named Ananias. He lived in Damascus and he had a vision and the Lord told him, 
Go down to this house on Straight Street. There's a guy there from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying, and he's seeing a vision about a man named Ananias coming in to place his hands on him so that he might see again. Ananias says, "Uh, Lord, a lot of people have told me about this Saul person and what he's been doing in Jerusalem to people who worship you, and you want me to go in and do this? But the Lord said to him, Go, because I have chosen him to serve me, to make my name known to Gentiles and kings and to the people of Israel. Ananias was probably thinking, You chose whom? Now, if there was one person who would be really difficult to accept, it would have been Saul. Saul had been guilty of so many crimes against Christians. He took part in the death of Stephen. He attacked the faith. He denied the message. He hurt the believers, even dragging them in chains to be imprisoned. Paul was doing this, even going out of the country to Damascus to persecute Christians. And yet Jesus called him to serve and called Ananias to welcome him. So we read, he did exactly what Jesus told him to do. He went into the house. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me. And he put his hands on him. Saul was able to see again. He stood up. He was baptized And after he was eaten, he went straight to the synagogues and began to preach that Jesus was the Son of God. Well, because Jesus led him to, Ananias welcomed someone who was not just different, but really hated. Someone who would have been a despised enemy of the early Christians. Someone who was viciously persecuting them. And Saul went from being the arch enemy of Christ to preaching in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God. Both Saul and Ananias were transformed from doing what they wanted to to doing what Christ wanted them to do. And when we listen for God's voice and put aside what comes naturally to us, we too can be transformed. Well, this past while, all too often, we easily remember numbers because we don't always know the names. Five, the number of people in one family who immigrated from Pakistan to London, Ontario, who were viciously and for four of them fatally run over by a 20-year-old pickup truck driver while they were just out for their evening stroll. There is evidence that it was a hate crime motivated because they were Muslims. That doesn't happen in Canada, does it? 14. The number of students at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal who were murdered because they were all women. Again, in Canada. 215. 215 indigenous children who disappeared into unmarked graves at the Kamloops Residential School in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. We usually are so proud of Canada's record on human rights and supposed lack of racial discrimination. Yet here we are, and a lot of us aren't sure how to feel right now. Should we be horrified? Absolutely. Should we be disgusted? Definitely. Should we be ashamed and disappointed that these atrocities could happen in our country? Yes, we probably should. Should we feel guilty? Should we feel guilty? I think maybe we should on a corporate basis, as the descendants of settlers or members of a church that did play a role in residential schools. But individually, I'll be completely honest with you. 
I'm really not sure. As individuals, we haven't played a direct role in any of these type of events. We don't condone them. We don't support them. We don't try to sweep them under a rug. When our family first saw the movie The Help, that amazing film about discrimination and mistreatment of black folks in Mississippi in the 1960s, it was so deeply moving. We saw it at Universal Studios in Florida, and I remember so well that when the house lights came up, we were the only four Caucasian people in the theater. And I felt the urge to apologize to everyone else there, even though we had nothing to do with what was being portrayed. Can we find answers or wisdom for this quandary in the Bible? Well, in Deuteronomy, which you probably know is a very harsh book, it says that God will punish sins down to the third or fourth generation. However, in Ezekiel 18, we read, But you ask, why shouldn't the son suffer because of the father's sins? The answer is that the son did what was right and good. He kept my laws and followed them carefully, and so he will certainly live. It is the one who sins who will die. A son is not to suffer because of his father's sins, nor a father because of the sins of his son. Good people will be rewarded for doing good, and evil people will suffer for the evil they do. In the resource page from the United Church of Canada that I sent out on June 2nd, there are prayers there that are powerful, and there are some suggestions of good that we can do in response to this tragedy. It might be helpful in times like these. Well, through being transformed by God, if we've had brokenness in our life, we can be made whole. If we've been addicted to something, we can be set free. And I don't just mean substance abuse. We might be addicted to things that we know deep down aren't quite right. Or maybe it's to shopping or overeating or being busy or praise from others, or maybe sadness, or maybe guilt. There are so many ways to be addicted. If something controls us, rather than us living a life free from such burdens, then we need to pray for help to be changed and set free by our faith. Now, the change inside may take a long time, and we shouldn't get frustrated if we don't see instant improvements. People grow and mature at different rates. Thomas Edison's teacher said he would never amount to anything, and he advised his mother to take him out of school. Winston Churchill, the great statesman, he was admitted to school in the lowest level classes and never moved out of the lowest group all the years he attended Harrow School. Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein seemed so slow and dull that his parents feared that he was mentally challenged. One observer has said, great minds and high talent in most cases cannot be hurried and like healthy plants, grow slowly. Our personal transformation may take years or it may come in a blinding flash of light, just like Saul. The timing really doesn't matter as much as the end result. As Paul wrote in the second letter to the Corinthians, for our life is a matter of faith, not sight. We may be carrying with us events in our past or present that we're not very proud of, but who are we to think that somehow we are unworthy of God's love? If God can call Saul if he could choose Saul, who hated Jesus and Christ's followers, we could be certain that we are not outside of God's love. We are precious in God's sight. We are forgiven, and we all are loved. God forgives us in Jesus Christ, so let's try 
to forgive ourselves. We have been chosen by God. And in that faith to believe that we too have an important mission. So if we find we're being called to make others aware of how church can help folks' lives, or maybe being called to a role in the church that's way outside our comfort zone, something we don't think we're qualified for, remember, God chose Moses, who claimed he couldn't speak very well, to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. God chose the smallest shepherd boy in the family to take on Goliath. And God chose Saul, of all people, to spread Christianity throughout the world. So why wouldn't God choose us? Whom does God choose? God chooses us. And for this we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as this is our usual offering time, many thanks to all those who feel compelled to support this ministry. If you're able to send in a check or perhaps make an e-transfer to donations at glenabbeyunitedchurch.com. Trust, it will be so appreciated and well used in continuing to carry the message to more people than ever. Thank you and God bless you. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Loving God, caring God, God who sees all that goes on, sometimes we do wonder. We wonder what has happened to this world. What has happened to this country of ours? What has happened when people cannot go out for an evening stroll and such a tragedy can happen? What is happening when children end up in unmarked graves and disappear from the landscape? What is happening when things go on that we cannot accept, we cannot understand, we cannot even be able to fathom? God, we need your help in this world to make it so much more forgiving, so much more accepting, and help us to get through any of these times. In our own personal lives, we have things going on. We have things we need help with. We have encouragement we need to be lifted up when we're lower. And we ask that you touch the lives of all those who are so in need of your help. And as we do have individual occurrences going on that maybe we don't want to discuss with too many people, We ask you now, God, please hear our silent prayers. And when the time is right, No matter how you choose to speak to us, Lord, we so look forward to your answer. And we thank you for this ministry. We thank you for our church, which continues to grow and thrive. And we ask that folks feel truly part of a church family who can do so much good in this world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of times we need to follow what Jesus wants us to do. And we're now going to sing hymn number 635. And may we truly be able to say, all the way my Savior leads me. Yvonne, choir, please lead us.
this time, I'd like to thank the choir for their wonderful music leadership all year long, the hard work that they put in rehearsing and recording, and the amount of work that Yvonne does to make these musical items happen each week. Thank you so much. To Rick Sands for his technical abilities that continue to help us to spread the message in ways that Paul would have absolutely loved to have had he makes it so easy, and he does such a wonderful job. Thank you. As well, to John Fleming for reading today, and to all of you for coming together as a family in Christ. It is so good to be back with you. We're going to have our choral blessing. We'll sing together, Go Now in Peace. Then we'll have a postlude, and then I'll be back for the final blessing. i 
So as we go into this week, let us look for ways that maybe God is leading us in directions that we hadn't considered before, in doing things that maybe we had never thought we were qualified to do, because with God's strength and encouragement, we can do anything. And may that incredibly generous love of God, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the guidance and strength and healing of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this week and forevermore. Amen. So have a very good week, and I'll be back in the pulpit next week. God bless you all.